A teacher, for example, can be entertaining, but a teacher is not to be an entertainer. Do you hear the difference? Okay. A preacher can say something that is entertaining, but preaching is not entertainment, and the preacher is not an entertainer. Do you hear the difference, yes or no? Okay, so the point is, is, is the entertaining thing the substance of what's being said, or is it just an element of something larger that's being said? If it becomes the substance, then you've turned yourself into an entertainer, you're promoting entertainment, and that's not preaching. But sometimes, let's be honest, life is entertaining. There are things in life that are clever and things that are serendipitous and things that are funny and things that are interesting and, thing, and things that are quirky. Yes or no? And if I'm going to preach true to life, then some of the things I'm going to say will be perceived as entertaining. If it wasn't, it would be out of harmony with life. But there's a huge difference between striving to be an entertainer and sometimes saying things that are also entertaining. Do you see the difference? Yes or no? Okay, and the question is, is what's the point? Is the goal entertainment or is entertainment a byproduct of the goal? Does that make sense? It's a byproduct. Yeah, listen, there are things in life that are funny. Yes or no? Yes. So some people will say, and I've had the experience of telling a story in my experience, or in my sermon, of something that happened to me that was funny. And I've had people come up to me, very pious, very well-meaning people, and say, y y y what, what are you, a comedian making these people laugh? And I'll say, no, 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 I'm not a comedian. You will never hear me say, did you hear the one about the so-and-so? Did, did you hear the one about the elephant and the mouse from the pulpit? You will never hear me. The day I say that is the day you, I give you permission to just walk up and kick me in the shins. I mean, I, never, ever. And I've heard preachers, like, open up with jokes. Okay, not appropriate. But if I tell a story that's funny, like my kids are afraid of motorcycles, and I tell this really funny story about how my kids were afraid of motorcycles and how they related their fear of motorcycles to God. It was just the, the funniest story. And you tell that story and it's funny. But the purpose of the story is not to make you laugh. It's to make a point. The fact that you end up laughing is just a byproduct of the story. Does that make sense, everyone? So that's how we find the balance. There's nothing wrong with entertainment and there's nothing wrong with humor. What is wrong is to make entertainment and humor the purpose of what you're saying to let it slide over to that. We together, everyone? So, and then he says, the entertainment can require some intellectual commitment and endeavor. But the arts, the arts really require us, true art requires us to be intellectually engaged with what the artist is trying to communicate, whether it's a musician, or whether it's a filmmaker, or whether it is a uh, 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 painting. You have to interact with the artist's intellectual endeavor and it requires intellectual endeavor to apprehend it. Make sense? So he basically sets things up on a tiered system. And he says that for the Christian, the art should be of the most importance, entertainment of uh, not as much important, and amusement should have very little to no particular importance in the life of the Christian. And he sort of sets up this hierarchy of art at the top, entertainment, and amusement. Does that make sense? Okay, so true preaching is not entertainment, but there will be things in any human endeavor that's entertaining. Okay? True preaching is not a talent show. True preaching is not a contest. God have mercy. I heard about this particular individual who was going to arrange a preaching contest, and I thought, if you do that, you, uh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my life. True preaching is not an advertisement for self. True preaching is not comedy hour. True preaching is not story hour. True preaching is earnest, but not wild and out of control. Amen? Amen. Okay, and so that's what we're talking about when we talk about charisma. Uh, we'll close with this statement from Evangelism, page 40. In the cities of today where there is so much to attract and please, can you imagine? The people can be interested by no ordinary efforts. Ministers of God's appointment will find it necessary to put forth extraordinary efforts, and I love this language here, in order to arrest the attention of the multitudes. Okay? And when they succeed in bringing together a large number of people, they must bear a message of a character so out of the usual order that people will be aroused and warned. They must make use of every means that can possibly be devised for causing the truth to stand out clearly and distinctly. Why? Because she's saying you're competing with so much. You're competing with so much entertainment. Can you imagine? Can you imagine saying that in those days? God have mercy, what is it today? I mean, many people can't sit still for 10 minutes because they spend so much time watching television or the movies where the camera angle is changing every 
you know, and you never get a chance to really, ah, 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 slow down. Our attention spans are so short, we just never get it. If that was true in her day, God have mercy, what is it today? The testing message for this time is to be born so plainly and decidedly, and I love this language, as to startle the hearers and lead them to desire to study the scriptures. Amen? Amen. We cannot be too much in earnest. I'll close with this. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll just read it for you if you'd like to join me there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 12, he writes, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. We're not trying to recommend ourselves. We're not advertising for self. And verse 13, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. What does it mean to be beside yourself? Crazy. Yeah, a little wild. If you say, I couldn't believe that she did it. I was beside myself. What you're saying is, you just were a little wild. You were just a little, you were stirred up. So look at what he says. He says, if in our preaching we come across as a little beside ourselves, that's just because we're trying to please God. If we get a little wild and get a little crazy and we, and we just preach with all of our hearts and our guts and our, our, our whole life is on display before you with all of our warts and we're just fired up, he says, hey, if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. And then he says... If, however, we are of sound mind, if we come off as sober and poised and articulate and educated and academic, and we come off in such a way that we persuade you to believe that the strength and the force of the arguments that we have presented compels you to make a decision, he says, that's for you. That's for you. We're doing our best. He basically is saying, when we stand up to preach, we are just preaching our guts out. And if we come off as poised and calm and dignified and organized, hey, that's to win you. But if we come off as a little wild and we seem a little beside ourselves, that's just because we, we're trying to stand before God. We're trying to stand before God. Paul here is saying, be earnest. Be earnest. When you preach, be earnest. Preach as one who is standing before God. Don't conduct yourself in such a way that you give people opportunity to write you off. But be earnest. Be intensely in earnest. And put forward no ordinary efforts, but extraordinary efforts to arrest the attention of the people. Amen? Amen. And do it in your own skin. Don't do it like me. Don't do it like Doug. Don't do it like Mark. Don't do it like Dwight. Do it like you. Do it like you. And so in closing our class on preaching, very simply, say it with me, preaching is what is true through you. And what are the four things we're going to be true to? We're going to be true to God. We're going to be true to text. We're going to be true to ourselves. And we're going to be true to life. Very, very good. And what is our sermon going to be on that we're coming up, our preaching practicum? New Testament, New Testament character, not Paul. not Paul, not Jesus. But all of our sermons will be centered in Christ. Amen? Amen? And so, remember, the messenger's commitment, be a preacher second and a Christian first. Amen. Okay, are we together? The meaning's correctness, preaching is what is true through you. And do not try to preach like someone else or you rob God of the unique contribution that you can make to the kingdom of God. God has something he wants to say through you. He has a message he wants to say through you, okay? The, the message is content. Don't preach 100 sermons. Give us a slice of bread. Make sure it has an educational component. Teach us something. Amen? Amen. Be sure it's true to the text. The master's confirmation, pray and plead for the Holy Spirit so that what you say is not just words in the air. It's the Spirit of God taking through that wonderful supernatural transaction and applying the words to the lives of people. And then finally, the method's charisma. Do your best. Do your best. Be earnest. Be extraordinary in your efforts. Don't be an entertainer. Don't do that. But definitely be passionate and earnest as you preach and proclaim the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, have we learned anything today? Yes. Okay, do you have a passion to want to preach? Yes. Good, and remember this message that you'll be preparing. Remember this message will be your message to the class some of whom you will not see until you stand with them on the sea of glass. Amen. So don't go all namby-pamby, wussy, taking your time, blah, 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 putting it off to the last minute and preaching some white bread, vanilla, toast, air-conditioned message. Shame on you. You put some time into this, you put some energy into this, and you have a message for your former students, many of whom you will not see again until you stand with them on the sea of glass. Your, your, your fellow students. Amen?
That, 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 can that light a bit of a fire in your, in your bosom? You better. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to be powerful preachers, but more than that, we want to be consistent Christians. Teach us what this means and may Christ be last and first and best and everything in our lives. May he be the first thing that we think about in the morning and the last thing we think about before we go to bed. May he be every thought in between. Father, teach us what it means to pray without ceasing and to dwell on him in every moment, in every circumstance, in every situation. Father, teach us what it means to live with Christ in us, for him to be our all in all. And Father, I want to pray for these committed Christians. Make them powerful, profound, spirit-filled preachers as well, whether to one or 100 or Father 1,000. Maybe there's a Paul in this room. I wouldn't doubt it. Maybe there's a Peter in this room. I wouldn't doubt it. But Father, to whatever extent and in whatever capacity you are calling us to be preachers, may we be true to God. May we be true to ourselves. May we be true to life. And may we be true to the text. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all of God's preachers say, Amen. Amen.